the Holy Gospel according to John. When it was when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thomas, Thomas, Thomas. <laughs> I know the guy. You know the guy. Even people who aren't familiar with Christian history use his name to jab at skeptics. Doubting Thomas, he of little faith. He gets a really bad time from modern day readers and throughout biblical scholarship. But if I'm being completely honest, I'm not sure he deserves it. You can call me a Thomas apologist or a contrarian or just an empath, whatever you will. I'm here to cut Thomas some slack. I want us to sit with Thomas understand Thomas, and even start to see ourselves in Thomas. So I'm going to start by making my case directly from the gospel today. When we start reading in verse 19, we hear how Jesus appears in resurrected form to 10 of the disciples. He appears, shares peace, and shows the present disciples his wounds. As he did, the disciples got excited, so of course they told Thomas, the disciple who wasn't present at the time, about the encounter. Thomas tells the other disciples, I'll believe it when I see it. And luckily, he does get to see it, just as the other disciples did. And that's the last we hear of Thomas here. So it seems pretty reasonable that just from this fragment of scripture, Thomas would be labeled as the doubting one. Backtracking a bit, though, even those who first saw the resurrected Jesus had doubt. Mary Magdalene didn't even recognize Jesus when he first started speaking with her outside the tomb because she was weeping with such great sorrow that Jesus' body had supposedly been stolen. But when he calls her name, she knows him. As for the other disciples, they too withheld faith until Jesus was truly revealed to them. In fact, they all but wrote off the women who had discovered the empty tomb, not believing their, quote, idle tale. They too held back until Jesus himself was revealed to them. All this is to say Thomas wasn't the first to doubt, and he's certainly nowhere near the last. So how did Thomas get stuck with the doubting no more? I honestly think Thomas just got the short end of the stick. Whether Thomas truly encountered Jesus separate from the other disciples, as in John's gospel, or he was with other disciples when Jesus first revealed himself to them, as other gospels vaguely suggest, I think Thomas' story is important to the narrative. Whether we care to admit it or not, 
Thomas's doubt is likely understandable and relatable to each one of us. Thomas's story is personal and tangible and a representation of all the doubt which has and does surround the resurrection story and the great mystery of our faith. So frankly, this story gives me hope <laughs> and it gives a lot of insight to how God feels about and responds to our doubts. So the good news of doubt is this. One, God is not incapable or unwilling to receive our doubt. We never have to fear rejection or condemnation for our questions. Two, God is not reluctant to be revealed in our lives. And three, doubt is not directly opposed to faith. I want to expand on that last idea because doubting is not really the greatest threat to faith. In fact, it's somewhat of an asset. I've heard this said by so many authors and speakers that I can't remember where it originated, but you might recognize the idea. It's that the opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. So I follow a former pastor turned cartoon artist on Instagram, and one cartoon he recently shared depicted this idea really well. Um, I'd show you, but I don't have the rights to it, so maybe you can look it up later. So <laughs> the image is just outside the pearly gates, and there's a trash can sitting between two people. And the first person, who is St. Peter, says to the other person, who is heaven's newest arrival, you'll need to throw your theology in here before we can let you in. I love that. <laughs> And the artist discusses in his caption how all the great theologians admitted that their attempts at understanding and articulating God fell short. Theology should be, and certainly is for those who make a profession of it, extremely humbling. At the end of the day, our, quote, study of God can be quite laughable. And I don't say that to mean our theological endeavors are fruitless, but rather that it's funny how we try to create a comprehensive understanding of God who is far beyond our understanding. Like the great theologians, we should be humbled. We should recognize where doubt and uncertainty do belong in our faith and leave at the pearly gates trash can what things we might cling to as certain. So what's the real problem with certainty? And what makes it the opposite of faith, as it's often claimed? Certainty can quickly become a death grip to what one might believe is exclusive and absolute truth. In reality, we could never do justice to an articulation of God. Sure, there are basic tenets of our faith that we hold with certainty. God, love, the cross, etc. And even those are limited by our humanity. How are we to explain a resurrected man? But there are also numerous man-made, unfounded doctrines that weasel their way into the church universal as absolutes. It's not lost on me that there are harmful, toxic, and even fatal, quote, theologies, which continue to persist in church cultures. There are Christians who deny queer people their God-given goodness, and condemn them to certain death for an expression of love in the name of doctrine. There are Christians who deny the diverse gifts within the church, claiming women are not ordained by God to teach or to lead in the name of theology. There are Christians who write off the voices crying for racial justice, who call for peace when they only mean silence in the name of the spirit and its fruits. There are Christians who believe humans are innately bad and hopeless creatures instead of good, created in God's image, beings who have fallen short of who and what they were created to be, all in the name of theology. It's no wonder that people, especially young people, leave the church in droves. Not only is doubt shamed, but so are many people's beings. Many come forward years later speaking about religious trauma, which can cause lasting psychological impact. Deconstruction is on the rise, not because people stopped believing in God, 
but because they stopped being complicit with the misguided certainties, those which don't reflect God, that the church touts. That is when certainty makes faith go sour. Is it faith at all when we choose to condemn the people we were told to love? No. In fact, it limits and restricts the mobility and the joy of the gospel, the most essential piece of our faith. Certainty becomes conditions, which doesn't exactly fit in with the God of unconditional love. So at this point, you might be wondering, and what does all this have to do with Thomas? Which is a great question because my main point was here and I'm currently here. Um, all of this is to say that doubt is far more compatible with faith than certainty. As a church, we are built on a divine mystery of love. Brene Brown said this, faith without vulnerability and mystery equals extremism. When we have all the answers, we don't need faith. It doesn't require trust. And as Anne Lamont put it, certainty is missing the point entirely. Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness, and the discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. I'll say it one more time because this really gets to my heart. Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness, and the discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. And I think Thomas certainly sat with an uncomfortable mess before he saw the light for himself. God can coexist with doubts, uncertainties, and questions because mystery is a fixture of our faith. The gray is good. If we have complete certainty, the answers to everything, there's no element of trust left. There is something truly human, and I mean this in the best possible way, in admitting that we do not know. There are questions we don't have the answer to, and we are at peace without explanation. We lean into the things which never fail us, love, compassion, understanding, grace, and wait patiently for the light to return where everything else we cannot make sense of. When we start to cultivate an environment like this, we become a safe space to any and all in need of love, all those questioning and all who desire to build a relationship with God. We become good news people. So my hot take on Thomas is this. I'm grateful for him. <laughs> I'm thankful he took the heat and represented doubt because this gospel reading shows us all something we needed to know. Our doubt does not make us unworthy of encountering Jesus and his grace. Thomas doubted, and he still received this blessing. And we may not see Christ now, but I pray the Spirit is revealed to you with anything from a flood of love on your soul to a call to service with a new heart. We are blessed, meaning we know we have the most to gain by believing without seeing. Uncertainty becomes a blessing from God to our faith. So I propose a toast and invite you to raise your metaphorical glass to Thomas. Go ahead, go ahead. To doubt and to mystery. I pray that we embrace doubt with loving kindness, trust God to fill in the blanks, and become a community where diversity of thought, curiosity, and humanity is appreciated, celebrated, safe, and holy. Amen.